Chefs Without Restaurants, episode 51 with David Petranzik. I, for a long time, had this, I, I don't know if it was guilt or I was kind of ashamed. Imposter syndrome that you're not a real chef? Yes, yes. I dealt with that for so long. This is the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast with your host, Chris Spear. Each week, I'll be speaking with food entrepreneurs and people in the culinary industry. If you're interested in learning more about our organization dedicated to helping people build and grow their food businesses, look us up on the web at chefswithoutrestaurants.com and .org, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Chefs Without Restaurants. Now, enjoy the show. On this episode, we have David Petranzik. He's the chef and product expert at Breville PolyScience. He also does some of their photography, videography, and marketing. We discuss modern kitchen equipment, imposter syndrome, virtual conferences and learning, niche Facebook groups, and Michelin restaurants, and if they can live up to the hype. We also talk about restaurants in general, and there's a pretty funny Thomas Keller story in there. I hope you enjoy the episode, and please leave us some feedback. Thanks to this week's sponsors, Tyler Wright, Danny Spletter, Ron Krieger, Cafe Bueno, Little Fig Bake Shop, Maryland Bakes, and the Savory Spoon Catering Company. If you want to support the show, our Venmo name is C-H-E-F-W-O-R-E-S-T-O-S. If you enjoy the show, have ever received a job through one of our referrals, have been a guest, been given complimentary Chefs Without Restaurants swag, or simply want to help, it would be much appreciated. Feel free to let us know if you have any questions. Thanks so much, and have a great weekend. All right, welcome, everyone. This is Chris with the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast, and today I have Dave Petranzik with me, and he is the chef and product expert at Breville PolyScience. Hey, how's it going? How you doing, man? Thanks for having me. I'm great. Thanks for coming on the show. I guess you and I have probably known each other for five or six years now. I mean, time flies, but uh, from way back from Star Chefs, you know? Probably even more than that. I've been with PolyScience around like seven, eight years, and I, uh, I was never at the Armory, but uh, the Pier was my first year as Star Chef, so that was like seven years ago, something like that. Oh, the Pier, <laughs> the Pier. Yeah, uh, like I notoriously, I think everyone who's at that one remembers the Pier. That was my third year, so uh, yeah, there were some great chefs that year and some really great things, but um, yeah, that that had its challenges, I think, before they moved over to Brooklyn. Definitely. That was, for us, that was, a that was, I mean, I didn't know better. That's, I, that's, I didn't know better. It was my, one of my very first trade shows that I did with poly science. And, um, I, I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, but there were definitely things that went wrong. Like there were some, po- there were some problems with, uh, power and water that, you know, we were at the pier till I think like 3 AM setting up and had to be back there at like eight. It was, um, that was a challenge. We made it happen though. That's what we do. Did you, I remember Rich Rosendale doing a sous vide a workshop. Were you guys involved with that at that time? Was that a poli science workshop? I don't know. I remember at that time, I, at that time, my role was different. Uh, I was, I was, uh, I was a low level thug uh, back in those days. I was just a wee fella. And um, I, I think Jalabo was in, was, was involved at that time before they started doing like one brand has exclusivity over a category. So it might've been, might not have been. I, the thing that I recall vividly about that uh, about that year was um, Sam Mason and Johnny Uzzini, Uh They were doing a warring demo, and I was t- I, I mean I still am. They're friends of mine, but I still am a fanboy of theirs. I love Johnny and I love Sam, and they were doing these um, ice cream balls. Like so, they did. They made a s'mores ice cream, and then with liquid nitrogen, they froze chocolate, marshmallows, graham crackers. Um, and then they, so they pulverized it into a powder and then they took this, uh, s'mores ice cream and kind of rolled it in these, in these things. Um, and they were serving it. Um, I think they were just serving it as, it as a ball. It might've been on a stick. I, I can't recall that, but it was absolutely delicious. And just like seeing them work was like, uh, it was really cool. Yeah, I did that. I know they did both. I believe both a workshop and a main stage. And I did the workshop. I also remember the workshop was dark because it was one of those days that they, they had lost power at the armory. <laughs> so half of my photos from that year didn't come out because everything was like pitch dark because they had no power there. 
Yeah, that sounds that sounds about right. I remember it, it might have been the class, but Sam did this. Um, he did a sandwich bread ice cream, and he he had it in a mold in the shape of a slice of bread, and then pulled a vacuum on it in like a vacuum canister so it stayed aerated, and then put it in the freezer. So what you ended up with was sandwich bread flavored ice cream in the shape and look and texture of sandwich bread. And then he put like peanut butter and jelly uh, and peanut butter and jelly ice cream in between it. I was like, well, that's smart. Like, <laughs> like that was really cool. So what exactly do you do at PolyScience? I mean, you're the chef and the product expert. I mean, I've um, interacted with you a lot you know, at Star Chefs, you're kind of like the guy who's in all the workshops when your equipment's being used. You're definitely a specialist. I've interviewed you. I did the, um, for Star Chefs, I did some writing and talked to you extensively about the control freak. So what is your, what is your job encompass there? Uh, I don't know if we have enough time to get that in one day. Um, but, uh, I don't know. So the way it started I, is, is that when we wrote the cookbook for, um, before we came on with Breville Phillips cookbook immersed, I had just gotten a DSLR and we were trying to figure out, uh, figure out how we were going to pull this thing off. And I was like, well, if I'm doing the rest, if I'm you know working on these recipes and stuff, I might as well photograph them and such. And then it came, and it came out. Okay. And then the next time we needed something, it was, Oh, could you do that? Could you do that? Could you do that? Could you do And uh, I'm not going to say no, you know, like, of course I can't, I'm a yes man. <laughs> you know, I, if, they ask me, I'm going to get it done or I'm going to, I'm going to figure out how to get it done. So my, my proficiencies in the Adobe suite kind of expanded uh, over time to InDesign, Illustrator, Lightroom, Photoshop, Premiere, After Effects, Audition, and all of these things. So um, my skill set as a creative, I use that. I do a lot of our marketing stuff. Uh, we work with um, a bunch of third-party content houses and also design agencies and things like that. There's always things that need tweaking or things that need adjusting. So that'll fall to me. And usually I'll brief them in on whatever that asset we need is anyway. Um, so I work, I work in marketing in that way. And then I'm also serve as a product expert. I use the products. I was a chef for, oh geez, I think, I think it was 10 years. <laughs> I was a chef for 10 years, you know, uh, doing the white, uh, you know, white jacket, you know, toke thing for, for a while. And um, I was a big fan of poly science. I used the products there. And then when I came on, on board, I kind of made it my responsibility to know everything there was to know about all of the poly science products. Still to this day, I'm, I'm working on behind the scenes on new product that's coming out, current product, supporting product that we don't even make anymore. So uh, I'm both product expert, I'm a trained chef, and then also um, I, I work in a marketing capacity as well. That's quite a background. I mean, I don't think there are many dual chef marketers out there. I mean, I wear the <laughs> chef hat first and now I've really gotten into the marketing. I mean, obviously I have my own podcast now, but not something that comes naturally to me. I kind of have been learning on the fly, but it seems like you're very competent at being able to do both of those roles. I think you are as well though. Like, cause I mean, so you do this, right. But you also do your writing. You also have your photography. You, you also have, you know, your, your events and stuff that you do. Um, so I think it's really much the same. I have needed to be able to swim in a big company, like probably a big company, right? Like they're half a billion dollars, right? So be able to swim in that sea, I had to get really, really good at what I did because, you know, they had, they work with these massive companies and, and such on these really high level projects that then they produce very um, uh, high level marketing assets. I needed to be able to do that or I was going to be, you, you don't do that anymore. And I didn't want to lose control of that. So it was like, all right, I just had to button up my sleeves and up my game. So it was, you know, I, every day, every day I try to learn one thing about Photoshop or Illustrator or Premiere that I didn't know before, how to mask things, how to color grade things, whatever it is. I try to learn one new skill set a day. Did you have any background in marketing, advertising, photography, writing? Was there any like college <laughs> courses that you did, or is zero, this all buddy? Really, zero, hundred nice. percent. So I, I came to, I came to poli science cursing like a sailor and having very, very low social skills. 
Uh, obviously, I could cook, but those weren't the skill sets that were necessary at my desk. Um, so it was it was a long road of um, self teaching, but that's cool because I I enjoy in, enjoy learning everything that I can. So um, it was a tough road, a long road, but I I enjoy it. I enjoy doing what I do. I know a lot of people hate it, but like building my own website, I didn't. I didn't have the money to begin with, but I actually enjoyed the process of like, okay, I've never built a website. Let's get a WordPress account and figure out how this works and then learn SEO and, you know, read a bunch of blog posts and watch some videos. And now with the podcasting, like the first podcast sounded like garbage. Like uh, they did, like, I didn't know anything about audio engineering. I didn't know anything about microphones and you just learn and you spend a lot of time and I'm trying to make every show sound better, look better and figure out all that stuff. And I enjoy that. I know a lot of people don't, and they would rather just hire someone to do that kind of stuff. But uh, I love the learning process. So, and I don't ever, and I think, you know, I've run large kitchens. I never want to know less about something than one of my employees, even though I was the chef, I yeah. wanted to make sure I was also the best bartender, that I was like the best front of the house manager, even though that that wasn't my day to day job. I wanted to make sure that I knew how to bartend better than my lead bartender, you know? there's some times where I look at like what I'm doing and I kind of just stop for a second and I say, why am I doing this? <laughs> like, how did I get involved in this? And it's just because I, I get myself into things because I do, I want to learn everything. I want to be good at everything. And I know pre COVID you were traveling a lot. What percentage of oh. your, t- what percentage of your time was, was dedicated to traveling? And then what does that look like now? Um, now is non-existent so that's an easy question to answer before that is a tough question so um how much of my time now i've met i i i can't really complain uh because i know i know a lot of guys who are on the road way more than me so i can't complain like um uh mercer culinary as an example those guys um i forget the gentleman's name but he lives here in chicago as well and he travels, I think he said like 200 and some days a year, he's not home. And I'm like, how could you even manage that, man? But I do try, I do a lot of ups and downs. So like, I'll, um, I support all of our distribution partners. So whether it's uh, a Cisco, Webstron store, Trimark, uh, Bar Green Ellingson, any, any mock for anywhere that you can buy our products, I'll fly there, uh, show up the day before, if I'm lucky, they have one somebody on the inside who will do like some grocery shopping and, you know, I'll send them a requisition list and, you know, they'll take care of that. Most of the times that's not the case. So I'll fly in really early, do grocery shopping, go there, prep, go over my presentation the night, the night before, show up in the morning, um, finish any mise en place, do a presentation, uh, talk business uh, with the salespeople for a while clean everything up and then hop a plane back. And I do a lot of that. Like there are times I'll do that like twice a week. Um, And then there's slow periods where I don't do it for like a month, but then I'll be gone for like five days or even like up to two weeks. So when I was in New York last, I think I had been, I think the way it went was like, I was in, I was in Milan, Italy at a trade show that was pretty grueling. It was a five day trade show, which is just bananas and um there was a day of travel on either and set up and tear down on either side of that i was home for two days and then i was in germany for another stretch of like six days and then i was home for like three days and went to new new york for like four days for the same thing and after that i took a vacation (laughs) because like it's just it can be insane are you enjoying the break yeah i it comes in waves. Like today I was actually feeling a bit nostalgic. I was talking to one of my former colleagues and I was like, Hey, I miss sleeping in like a, you know, a hotel and, and doing, and, you know, grabbing dinner at the local wherever that we can find and, you know, doing a presentation first thing in the morning and like scrambling to the airport. Like I kind of miss that lifestyle a little bit, but yeah, of course I'm happy to be home. I'm happy to uh, take care of my lawn and, you know, cook my own meals and just be with my wife. And I'm very happy for that. Yeah, so weird. No restaurant shows this year at the Javits Center. No restaurant show in Chicago. Um, Nothing. Such such a weird time. I was at the Philly Chef Conference in March, and it was like March 1st and 2nd. And it was just as things were getting weird. You know, like COVID was something that maybe was in other countries. We were starting to see here, but I still went there. I was hugging people. You know, they, they had food there, and you were sharing plates of food with strangers and 
And then yes. right after that, like that was it. That like that was the last thing that I did that was big. You know, the, then the next two weeks I had to work. And I look back, I'm like, wow, the Philly Chef Conference this year is probably like the last trade show I'm gonna have been at in quite a long time. Yeah. The Javits Center we didn't go to for uh International Restaurant Food Service New York. Uh I think is what that show is, but um I heard it was very slow, but the people who were there wanted to be there, right? Like people knew things were starting, it was starting to get weird. People knew there was a thing happening. So the people who were there wanted to be there. So from what I understand from other manufacturers that, that we talked to and friends in the industry, it was still a decent show, uh, but very low foot traffic. Then NRE didn't happen at all. A, a lot of people are doing these virtual trade shows, which we haven't participated in yet. And I, I don't know if I'm on board with like part of going to a trade show is being at the trade show and seeing things and a digital experience is not the same. Like you, you can't, I mean, not that we have a choice right now, but you can't replicate a trade show experience in the digital platform. Yeah. A lot of those things don't translate. Even like I'm in the chamber of commerce and I loved going to every month they had a mixer and now they've been doing them online. And I'm just kind of like, I don't know. It's not the same. Like, I don't feel like opening my computer yep. and sitting down on a Zoom thing with like 20 people from the chamber and talking to them. Like, my heart just isn't in it because it's not even close to being the same thing. Yeah. So I think the next thing that we'll attend, I think the next thing that we'll attend is pro actually, so right now we're entering slow season. I mean, last year was actually, well, last year was actually busy because that's when I was in Germany and I was in Italy and all that. But international shows typically happen like every two years here in the States. We do yearly stuff. International stuff is kind of in like a two-year program. Sirha happens um, next year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and that's in February, maybe in France. So um, we may be there. Who knows? How much do you feel you need to sell your stuff? I mean, it seems like in the culinary world, people know about poli science and it seems like you probably have some really great chef ambassadors. Like in my opinion, like the, there's some really solid people using your stuff and I'm sure they're great spokespeople for it. So how much do you need to actually still go out and do the hard sell and say, no, the control freak is awesome. The smoking gun is awesome. Or does it kind of sell itself because you have really great chefs who use your products and promote them? Every single day is a push man like every single i'm glad it appears that way to you that there are so that that we are this um this thing that people you know know about and are aware of but um still when i when i tell people that you could smoke potato salad they go what really you know like there's so many people who just it still hasn't you know it hasn't hit that far down yet and um especially like the control freak the control freak actually right now is doing amazing took a while um, to get up to speed, just like sous vide. I remember going to an ACF conference. Uh, I think that was actually my very, very, very first show at Poly Science, and that was in 2013, I believe. I remember going there, and there were people who would actually like stop at our booth, uh, like stop outside the booth, you know, that that where the carpet ends, that sacred territory. You you don't cross it if you're not interested. And uh, they would stop at the edge of the booth, and they would actually scoff at, at our products and like, what is this cooking in a bag? This is crazy. You know, who does this? You know, I don't need that. That's for cheaters or whatever the you know the thing they used to say was. I remember that, and then slowly it got it shifted because we were with ACF uh, for a very long time. And then it kind of changed. Oh, I've got, I've got five circulators. I got seven. What new do you have? Oh, you got a new, like people had adopted it. With the control freak, when we started it, it was the same thing. Why do I need this? What's different about it? And all of that. And there were some growing pains, but now people are starting to see it. But then you still got people who like, they don't understand um, how to use the probe control and like how, how magical that is or, um, you know, people say, I don't need to sear, you know, a steak at 401 degrees versus 202 degrees. Like, no, you probably don't need a very specific temperature, but at least you know where the heck you are as opposed to not knowing anything at all. Like you put something on a grill that's hot and, okay, how hot is it? You know, how long will it take when it's done? That's the chef answer. When it's done, it's done. Like, whatever. So it's, it's, it's still a push, but, um, we have a ton of great assets. I work every day on it and, um, we love the control freak. It's, it's doing really well. And I'm, it's probably, it's probably my favorite product at this point. Yeah. It's really cool. It's on my wish list of things to get. And you don't actually, have one? 
I don't have one yet, you know, and I talked to you and I need to add it to my arsenal of things, especially with my personal chef business, because going out to people's homes, like I don't bring employees with me usually. So I'm trying to do a five, Everything. six course meal for like, uh, I did a dinner for 20 people the other night by myself. And, and that was a hump. And there are so many stories like that. I did this dinner for 30 people. I did this dinner for 20 people. I did this, you know, I, I was in this crazy situation and I needed to make it happen. There's so many people who are in that situation and that's what the, these tools are there for. They're there for you to, to help you manage it. It's not a toy. It's a tool to help you manage that workflow um, and put out an amazing product. And um, it, there's just so many people who are, are tools like help in situations like that. And to be honest, I feel like a control freak, I would actually use way more than even a circulator and a sous vide setup. Like, I don't know, just because, you know, it's like less workflow too. the whole idea of like getting something, bagging it, sealing it, whatever, taking that for me, I'd rather just be able to have this thing on and it's going and it's at this temperature and being able to control that super precisely. I mean, you know, I've taken numerous control freak workshops at Star Chefs because I wrote, I did the editorial for them. I think that was Brad Kilgore's um, demo that he was using. You and I spoke on the phone for like an hour and a half one day. I remember because I was at my actual job before I left there and I was like sitting outside by the dumpster talking to you for like <laughs> an hour and a half getting all the, the specs for that. I mean, it's such a great piece of equipment and you know, I'm surprised more people don't have it because it's really reasonably priced for what it does and I'm sure the, that it holds up really well and you could get your money oh, yeah. out of it in no time. We have, um, I think our failure rate is like less than 1%. Like, I mean, they're, they're, the, the build quality of those is insane. The, um, as an example, the, the temperature probe that goes through the glass, there's a little rubber gasket on it that goes up and down. And I forget, I forget the name of it, uh, but they actually use it to gasket the doors on space shuttles because of its temperature, just, uh, temperature resistance uh, and durability under high temperatures and it's the only material that has this sort of flexibility characteristic. So yeah, like we went overkill and selected this really crazy material. But those material choices go throughout like the whole product, like the fans that we that we chose that cool the interior, like those could power a jet engine. Um, we have new circulators coming out. They actually have a ruby in them. And I'm like, everyone gets to say that their circulators are baller because they actually they have a ruby in there. And it's just because it, it may, it, it, it's for the longevity of the product. Like our products are known to last forever. So we just have to keep that up. How many items in your product line? I mean, obviously you've got the control freak, the smoking gun, you have all of your circulator stuff. Are you still making the anti griddle? I know that was a thing and then it kind of wasn't. And am I correct? Did that come back a little bit? Yeah, so there was a there it, it did come off the. I'm surprised you you're very astute, uh, Chris. I love talking to Philip when I see him, and he's always good for a half hour or so conversation when you see him at Star Chefs. Absolutely, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. There it came off the market, and then there was a re-release of it, and it's it's still on the market now. Yeah, so that's back. Uh, we have the um, sort of quiet. We don't really um, promote it too much. It's sort of it's. It has its place in in the food and beverage industry, so we sell it as well. Uh, the sommelier, which is like a hyper wine decanter, it has some drawbacks because it, it has a cord, so you can't do it table side, but you can do it at a bar. Uh, so it, it has its place. Uh, so we have the sommelier, we have Sonic Prep and Rotovap uh, circulators. We have our vacuum sealers. We have the 400 series, which is a HACCP vacuum sealer. We have one for home, and uh, we have a new one that we're onboarding uh, the MX Infuser, uh, that one has has yet to launch. You heard it here first, folks, uh, on Chefs Without Restaurants. You heard it, heard it here first. I think it was my first year at Star Chefs. Dave Arnold, Dave is a crazy guy. We were at the Poly Science booth and that predates you by a couple of years, but he grabbed the ultrasonic homogenizer and it makes that like squeal sound. Yes. And is it like when it's not in something and he and I were yes. the booth and we were talking about it and he's like, Oh, I got something. You got to hear this. And he like put it up towards my head and turned it on. And that sound like I can still almost to this day hear that like high pitched squeal that like went straight through my brain. And I thought I was gonna have an aneurysm when I heard that thing. Yeah. That, that was like a super awesome piece of equipment to see. I don't know what I would ever do with it. I mean, I guess like you can make what like mayos and stuff and they'll hold together and never break apart. Is that kind of what that does? You can make super stable emulsions without emulsifiers because it um, uses cavitation to split the surface tension of um, the similar um, particles and then 
So basically everything uh, becomes homogenous. Uh, you, you can use it for that. I don't typically use it for that. I typically use it for infusion. Um, if you need to do some, some sort of rapid infusion, um, it's good for that. Uh, the sonic prep is cool, but <clears throat> there's other ways to do those techniques. And it's, it's quite expensive. It's, it's really cool, but it, it, there's a place for it. So if there's a couple bars that we know in Asia and they have them out in their, like behind their bar and they'll make bitters like a la minute for a guest which is totally over the top, but that's what people are going there for, you know? So it, it has its place. Rotovap is really cool. I love playing with that. I'll leave it there. I love all that nerdy equipment. I actually uh, connected with Rich Rosendale last week and went out to his test kitchen and was looking at all of his equipment. I got super excited at all the stuff he has. Like he has a uh, equipment like that, like the Rotovap. And I'm like, I don't know what I would do with that either, but, uh, but I'm sure I'd find something for that. So for so with the Rotovap, it's basically a way to make either really beautiful distillates or concentrations. So uh, and the, the, what you do with the distillate is up to you. Technically, it's illegal to make a distillate out of alcohol, right? Um, to either distill or redistill a spirit. Um, but if you're uh, uh, walking a gray line, um, you know, grapefruit gin is a really delicious thing. I tell you. So you can make really beautiful things like that, or else uh, you could. Uh, let's say you're going to distill Granny Smith apples. And you end up with this liquid that smells intensely of Granny Smith apples. And then you vacuum seal it in with a watermelon. Now you've got watermelon that smells like Granny Smith apple. And that really turns someone's head upside down, let me tell you. Or you can do really cool things with it. Like certain things distill better than others, like chocolate um, distills really well. The flavor of chocolate distills really well. And then you've got to sort, sort of balance it back out with like sugars and, and, and powdered acids if you want it to stay clear. Uh, to kind of get the flavor back, because really what distills out is the is the aroma and some flavor. But uh, the wackiest thing that I've done with it was make clear chocolate soda. I was actually chasing clear chocolate patafui. So I wanted to make like clear chocolate fudge was the idea. But I never got it to work right because of the pH and, and such and getting it to set. And I, I'm not a pastry chef by any means. I'm sure somebody could do it if I gave them like where I left off. But I could never make it work. And then you've got this, this, um, the evaporating flask, you get a really beautiful concentration. So if you're doing, um, like as an example from the chocolate, you, you're left with this intensely, intensely chocolate ganache. If you take, um, apple cider or strawberry juice and run it down, you can actually make like strawberry butter out of just strawberry juice, just by concentrating the juice itself, which is, let me tell you, absolutely delicious. There's so many interesting, weird things out there that people are working on. I don't even, I can't even begin to start to think about that kind of stuff. Neither can I. I'm always impressed when I go and see it in action, you know, working with guys like that. My, my first uh, introduction to m most of this is I took a workshop at uh, French Culinary at the time with uh, Dave Arnold and Nils Noren, and yeah. I literally had no idea who they were. Like my company. Nobody did. My company was giving me thousands of dollars in continuing ed that I never used. And after like four years at my company, I was like, oh, there's this molecular gastronomy workshop in New York City. Can I go? These guys sound pretty cool. And I convinced my bosses to pay for me to go to New York City. I had never heard of cooking issues. I didn't know Dave or Nils. I didn't know anyone. And then I got there and then, you know, you go down the rabbit hole and they're talking about ideas and food and all these like cool people yeah. that I had never heard of. I I didn't even have like a Twitter account or anything. And then Dave got me into the world of like New York City cocktails and all this weird stuff. And I, I've often said that I don't even think I'd have my business today if I had never gone to that and met Dave. That like, if you backtracked my history of how I got to where I am now, it all started by meeting Dave Arnold in 2000 and I don't know, 10, maybe in New York City. Yeah, that was the in, that was the infancy of our brand. Well, actually, technically the infancy was like 2005, but that 2009, 2000. Uh, like 2009 to 2011 were like, it was a really special time frame for us there. That was kind of when things were like really exploding. Actually funny. So I never met, I've never met Dave Arnold. Not ever. What? Never. He's not even like come by. He's not even come by like, cause I've seen him at star chefs. I saw him at star chefs in Brooklyn like a couple of years ago and you must've been there. <laughs> star chefs. I'm running around <laughs> yeah. like a madman. So he, he and I have always missed each other in the building. David Chang. I've never met. I've never met, again, another person who you think I would have, Thomas Keller. I was in the same building as that man 
hundreds, like not hundreds of times, but many times. And I never had a chance to meet him. And uh, it was funny. So my Thomas Keller story is that uh, I was at NRA. I think this was two years ago. And um, he and Philip are friends. And um, like the years leading up to it, you know, TK is always there with like Rationale or Heston or whoever it is. And he does a thing in their booth and, and, and that's that. And he's like, oh, and Philip was like, oh, I'm, Thomas is going to stop by and this, that. And I was always ready. I had my French laundry cookbook. And I'm like, if he stops by, I don't care how embarrassing it is. I'm asking him for his autograph on this thing, right? Never. He never came by. Never came by. So like two years ago, I'm just working in the booth, you know, doing whatever I was, you know, doing. And I turn around and I bump into this guy and I look up and it's Thomas Keller. And I swear my heart sank into my feet. Like I, I didn't know what to do. And I immediately like start shaking. And what do, what do I say to him? I'm like, chef, it's a pleasure to meet you. Can I just say you're like a unicorn? <laughs> like I've heard that you exist, but I've never seen you anywhere. <laughs> and like, and I tell him like I've been with Poly Science for this long, and you're I know you're a friend of Philip and all this, and you know uh, we've emailed and this that, but I have never met you. Nice to meet you, man. <laughs> and like that's what I say to Tom. I'm sure Tom. he looked at you like you are the most ridiculous person. Well, I mean, it wasn't to that level, I met him in Philadelphia. He was doing a talk and a book signing with Michael Ruhlman. So it was probably one of the books that had just come out. But I have my Becoming a Chef that I've had everyone sign. I know you've signed that book. I've had almost 200 chefs sign that book. But I remember giving it to him. And it wasn't a book that he or Michael wrote. And I remember him looking at Michael and saying, I don't even know what this book is, but sign it. And it was kind of like this weird thing. I gave him this book to sign, but it wasn't like the French Laundry book. It wasn't one of Ruhlman's books. He was just kind of like, whatever. And I'm like, nice to meet you. And I got a quick, like kind of awkward photo. And then they shuffled me out of the line. So that's like the only time I've met Thomas Keller. It wasn't very meaningful, but I got him to sign a book. So I'm, I'm cool with that. I actually, so I was fortunate to eat at a uh, French laundry last year. Um, there was a conference uh, at CIA worlds of flavor and um, we were for, I was fortunate enough to get a table there and I, I, I go to the bathroom and they have this, you know, new kitchen. And from the outside, it's all glass. Well, to get to the bathroom, you have to go outside and you kind of, you walk past the kitchen. And um, I, I came back from the bathroom and I'm like looking inside, like kind of just like staring around, you know, just, you know, doing the, you know, looking at, you know, the fishbowl of chefs in front of me. And then I realized right in front of my face is Thomas Keller, like staring back at me, like, what is this guy doing? Um, so I, I immediately like freak out and I like very qu quickly and abruptly walk myself back to my seat. And I'm like, he's here, he's here, he's here, he's here, he's here. What do I do? Do I ask to see him? What do I do? So actually they knew that, um, that we were there. And at the end of the meal, we got invited into the kitchen and I got a picture with him and he signed a book for me. So it wasn't my French laundry book, but I got an autographed book from Thomas Keller. That's very cool. I have, uh, I think two books signed by him. So, but neither one of them is the French laundry book either or anything he wrote. Another one was a, like an anthology that he was in. So again, I had him sign at this event, two books that were not his books. And he's kind of like, eh, whatever, you know, I don't know. I probably shouldn't even say this. Like, I'm not even really interested in that food anymore. You know, there used to be a time when I was really interested in kind of like the Michelin three star. I feel like that's kind of worn off and I would rather just go eat at like, I think, I think like the Michelin one and two star places are really awesome. And like the yes. three star, like I'm not into the stuffy service. Like I would rather go to Empeon and have like a really interesting Mexican meal from Alex Dupac than go and eat at, you know, per se, when I'm in New York, I used to go to Star Chefs. The first year I went and ate at La Bernadette because I'd never been and I awkwardly got a table by myself and was like sitting smack dab in the middle of the dining room and did the full like 15 course menu because I thought, you know, it would be good to experience. And it was a great meal. But at the end of the day, I would rather just go to like some cool place in Brooklyn that's like a Michelin one star and have like a really solid meal in a unpretentious environment. I don't think it's the pretense. I think that there that when you're talking three stars there, it has this, you know, air of, um, 
you, it's this expectation and you at being a culinarian, you imagine it to be so much more grand than it could ever possibly be. It could, none of the, very few of these places, it's even possible to live up to your expectations because in your mind, you've made it to be this, this thing. But when you go to like a one or two star, you're like, it's, oh, it's going to be really good. And like, it's, it's that, but when it's three stars, I don't know, it's just this mindset. It is just going to, your mind's going to melt when you eat this food. And I, and it just very rarely in my experience, does it, does it live up to that experience? It's usually very, very good, but it's not, you know, what my mind had made it out to be. Yeah. And I'd almost rather spend the money and go to like two solid one or two star restaurants. Like when you look at dropping like 250 to $500 on one meal, I feel like if I'm going to be in a place, I would rather go to like two really great places than like one spend all my money kind of restaurants. Oh, absolutely. Like when we were at, so like when we went, when we went to French Laundry, yeah, I was there on a work trip, but make no mistake, work didn't pay for that. I paid for that. Right. And, um, then we went to, uh, one of the other days we went to, um, ah, Charter Oak, Char- we went to Charter Oak, man, that like blew my mind. I had no, I didn't know what it was. Somebody had just said, Hey, Charter Oak, and um, of course, the chef's name escapes me at this moment. Christopher Christo Costo. Yes. Because um, they did like a main stage. They closed out Star Chefs. I want to say like two years ago, they did the final uh, right. main stage of the day. And I think that was like two years ago. And it was kind of like the Charter Oak experience. And they invited people to come up on the stage at the end and like eat food as they usually do at the end of the thing. Yeah. his. I mean, I, I, I love what he's doing there from what I've seen. I love his cookbook. Um, and I would love to go out to that. Is that like kind of live fire? Like they're doing everything live fire kind of style? Yeah. So there's this big, like when you walk in, um, I'll send you just I'll send, uh, for grins. I'll send you my Flickr link from that, from that trip after this. Uh, so you can see the space. It's really cool. So there's this like, it's kind of like dark and they have this beautiful seating out store outside with this huge fire. And like, you can have like a, a really awesome old fashioned or whatever it is like before your meal you go inside and it's kind of dark, kind of very like, you know, wood tones and stuff. And there's this gigantic fire, like on this back wall. And there's this guy, you know, cooking all the, finishing all this stuff. Now don't get me wrong. They use sous vide and other, you know, techniques, but it's more behind closed doors. And it's just, the focus is on this, you know, this hearth. But what it was actually the, the thing that like kind of really, that made the dinner for me was the dessert cart. So they have a dessert cart that they push around your table at the end of your meal, kind of like, you know, whatever, you know, like old school service. They have this dessert cart and they bring it around and they're like, well, we have this, we have this, we have this. Would you like one? And um, so the desserts that they had, they had three. One was um, this, one was like ice cream. So it was like um, a cow's milk ice cream from, you know, their cow. And they churned it like hand crank in uh, at the table for you and then topped it with like you know some berries from you know their garden that was cool they had this uh, a chocolate molasses tart and i think they basically like whipped cream at the table from that same cow uh they whipped this cream there at the table like over ice and then there was a third one which i think was a pavlova and i forget like what connection that had but like it was semi-interactive. It was just, it was very cool. So you're going to be doing the ISVA online sous vide conference this summer, correct? That's right. So, um, so I'll be doing, so, so far I'm on the docket to do three things. So one is going to be just a general education uh, talk. So last year I did, um, I did two uh, Beyond Steak and Eggs uh because i think sous vide just gets um sort of put in this like you know it's only good for steak or you know poached eggs at you know 60 whatever degrees and that's not true so i did so i did one on that and the other one was um, i was at a workshop you did that was lentils and hollandaise you and you and aj did a battle and there was a black lentils and a holidays yes. and it was conventional versus sous vide so that was on the second day and i was definitely in there because i have a picture of the two of you doing that that was the pro track so that was like the 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 pro chef version so that was a little bit longer i think that talk was like 45 minutes to an hour or something like that but there was another one it was beyond steak and eggs and 
course now I can't remember the other one, but anyway, so I did like two sessions and then like the pro track. So this year I'm going to do, um, one, one general session. I'm going to do a pro track. And I think that's going to be focused on implementing sous vide within your business because I, I got an email. I, I always get emails from people like, Hey, I have this type of restaurant. How should I use sous vide? And like, oh my gosh, to take a look at someone's menu and you're like, you could use it here, 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 like all these things. So it'll sort of be something like along those lines, like I'll look at a menu and then kind of go from there. I might even freestyle it just to make it genuine. Um, like I'll have a couple menus and then like, I'll just start talking about implementation from there, uh, how I would do it. And then the third thing I'm doing is, uh, is like a, they're calling it like a lunch and learn. So people will sign up for the lunch as, as I understand it. People will sign up for the lunch. I will publish, um, the recipes for like for the mise en place for the class. So people can bring like sous vide product, like anything that needs to cook for, I don't know, however many hours will already be done and iced. And then we'll finish things together and people will have in my class, a cocktail and, um, and a lunch, uh, entree. I'm really interested to see how that goes. I had uh, both Mike Me and too. <laughs> I had Mike and Jason on the show the, like two episodes or, ago or so. Cool. We talked about that. So I know they're excited for it. I'm looking forward. And, you know, it'll be interesting. Like I said to them, there was no way I was going to be able to, you know, even pre-COVID get on a plane this year and fly out to San Francisco. And I think, again, like my podcast, what you give up in the hands-on aspect I think you can pick up in a global audience of people. Now it's less monetary commitment. You're not buying a plane ticket cross country, having to stay in a hotel and put up for the conference. So, you know, the ticket costs a little less. It's a very different vibe. I mean, I love an in-person experience, but I hope that they have a really good turnout for this because the level of talent that they have at this thing this year, the people who've committed to it. I mean, you don't have chefs who are going to miss a plane. (laughs) (laughs) We, 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 I caught that. We joke about that. They mentioned it on the podcast that, you know, I mean, but those kind of things happen. I mean, last year, one of their keynote presenters literally missed a plane and couldn't come out to his thing. And now hopefully uh, he won't have any, James won't have any issues this year doing it, but you know, it's nice that I'll be able to, you know, hopefully drop in from my, home here in Maryland and, and can do that. Whereas I wouldn't have been able to do that previously. Yeah. I mean, I see it from that perspective. I see it from that perspective and I'm glad that you have that outlook on it. Cause you know, have me having been to so many, you know, I'll say like brick and mortar trade shows, um, you know, doing that circuit for the, you know, eight years running now or whatever it is. Um, I'm very used to that format. So I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm skeptical about the the virtual platform, but I'm curious to see how it goes. Jason and Mike are super smart guys and they're going to figure it out. The crowd at ISVA last year was like one of the best, uh, honestly, like everybody who was in that room was super engaged and like a sous vide nerd in the the most endearing terms. And um, everybody wanted to be there and it just had this really awesome vibe about it. It was this like really cool little special thing that was just kind of happening um, at this hotel. And then there was a really cool dinner, like Cuisine Solutions did an awesome event. Uh, Meathead did some cool stuff. Um, I cooked one of the nights too. Um, it, it was really cool. It was a really cool event. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is really hard because one of my favorite things is to connect with people at the event and you're not going to have that same experience. I mean, I literally only met Jason because of Star Chefs because we were I think for like three or four years before I knew him, knew him, we were in the same workshops. Quite often we've been at the same tables and you strike up a conversation. It's like, oh, hey, you know, I'm Chris. Remember, I think we did some workshops last year. I don't know that you get that same feel when you do an online class. When I look at all the people that I've met through the different things, whether it be Star Chefs ICC or last year's ISVA, I think the connection you can make with people in person is very different. I don't know that if I'm doing a virtual workshop with you online that you and I are going to become friends on the same level as if we had met in person and shared a table at a workshop. I, it's not going to happen, but of course, but I mean, Hey, look, we're all adjusting, right? We're doing what we got to do. We do what we've got to do and we'll see how this goes. Um, you know, I'm disappointed because star chefs is like literally my favorite thing every year in October. I mean, I don't think they've made an, uh, an announcement either way. I haven't seen anything about it, but I can't imagine that thing going off the way that it normally would in October. It's not. It's going to be a virtual. 
I mean, have you seen anything officially on that? Because I haven't seen anything announced. Have you? Yep. Or maybe not officially. I don't know. I don't know what's public. <laughs> you, but, probably, um, you probably have like an inside track on that. Yeah. I mean, unofficially. Yeah. I don't, I, it's going to be virtual this year. Yeah. And it's not going to be the same. It'll just make next year that much better. Right. What I think they're going to do or what I think the, from what I've heard, the plan is, um, cause I think it's 15 years. I think it's a 15 year anniversary of star chefs. Um, is to, because, you know, they always have a bunch of photography coverage, press coverage, uh, video coverage, mainstream coverage, cause they have all of those things. What they intend to do, which I think is kind of cool is, um, bring out all that archival content on this like online platform, which I think would be pretty cool. And one of the things that will, uh, of, at star chefs was saying was that they are, they are working to comb through it so that the content like you wouldn't watch something and be like oh that's not you know that that's old school that that technique is you know we don't do that anymore but you would look at it and you go damn that technique like morimoto did that on stage like 10 years ago and that's still badass you know I actually bought some of the DVDs from years past um, to watch them because some of those were really good because there's so much going on. You miss so much and you say, oh, I'm yeah. going to catch Morimoto on the main stage. And then, you know, you're having a cocktail down on the trade show floor with, you know, me and you and you're like, oh, shit, I missed Morimoto. Um, so I've had some of that stuff. I'm surprised they haven't put out more stuff since you go to every workshop and main stage and they have all this in their recording and you literally never see it. Like, where did that go? You know, there's guys in every workshop with a camera in your face. And it's like, yeah. I would have loved to see that. Like so many of those workshops, I'm trying to take notes super fast and I've missed so much of it. And then that never shows up anywhere. I don't know what happens to it. It's just like, oh, we recorded it and for recording sake, but it never gets put out there for anyone to download or, or purchase or anything. Yeah, I actually, that's a great question that I would love to know the answer to. Like, where does that content go? Because like, as you said, there's always, you turn around and there's a camera in your face for sure. But I've never seen any of that content. Yeah, the first couple of years they put out DVDs. And I only know this because one year I bought tickets and then something happened and I don't, like I couldn't go uh, or I couldn't stay as long as I wanted. And they refunded my money um, back to star chefs. Like I paid for workshops that I couldn't attend and they're like, we don't do refunds, but you can use the money on starchefs.com and you could buy like DVDs of previous years, ICC. So I bought that just cause I had like a hundred dollars in like star chefs credit or whatever that means. Yeah. I love star chefs and I su- I'll support whatever they do. I wish, I wish I could get my hands on some of that archival content, but, um, yeah, we'll have to see with how they, how they pull it off this year. Yeah. I've gone to recording workshops on my iPhone and I have some really cool audio from those. I don't know if technically I'm allowed to even release them, but I have. Um, My most popular podcast, which is, it's stupid. Jeremy Umansky did a workshop a couple of years ago and I was writing about it and I literally recorded it on my phone. So I had notes to do my um, editorial on and three years later, I just reached out to Jeremy, no one at Star Chefs, and said, hey, I've got this great thing and the quality is pretty good. Do you care if I release it? And he was all for it and I released it. I am amazed. It's my actually most listened to and downloaded podcast of Chefs Without Restaurants ever. That's ever. cool. It's not even an interview. It's literally, I dropped my iPhone on a table there and had like a little mic on there and recorded it just for my own notes. And put that that shows you like people are rabid about that kind of stuff. I feel like sous vide's the mm-hmm. same thing. When I talked to Jason, he says they have like 40,000 members in their Facebook group. It's insane. I'm like, you have 40,000 members in your Facebook group. Like I have 500 in mine and I'm having trouble moderating. Like, what do you do with 40,000 people? Like I need a group with, I don't know. Maybe I don't need a group of 40,000 people. He's got amazing food made easy. I think it's like amazing food made easy. I think there's a sous vide one. There's like the IS. There's like three that I think he and Mike like moderate. But overall, all across all of them, it's I'm he he's been at it for so, I'm not you have as well, but he's been at it for like so long. Like I don't know, I don't know how he grew that audience, but God bless him. Yeah, I think one you know we talk about that a lot in my circle is like finding a niche thing and drilling into it. You know, it's not enough to just be a group about cooking or whatever, like sous vide is a very specific thing. And if you're a subject matter expert, I think you can really build a following around that, which is where I've kind of looked at chefs without restaurants. I mean, there's a million chefs out there and a million chefs who work in restaurants, but kind of focusing on 
caterers, personal chefs, food truck operators, kind of really specialize in that. And some people said, you should branch out and have your podcast be for everyone. It's like, but then you're just another restaurant podcast. And I want it to be more about the entrepreneur side of starting a food business or something or, or really exploring interesting things. Like you're a chef, but you don't work in a restaurant and just kind of highlighting saying like, there's so many cool things you can do as a chef that just you're not a line cook or an executive chef in a restaurant. Dude, I, I th- I've told you this before, but I, I, to get it on record, like I was, the fact that you're doing this, I'm super stoked for because I, for a long time, had this, I, I don't know if it was guilt or I was kind of ashamed. Imposter syndrome that you're not a real chef? Yes, yes. I dealt with that for so long. Okay, story time. So um, I, was at, I was at Worlds of Flavor and you know Jamie Simpson? Oh, Question absolutely, Jamie. from Chef's Garden. Okay. Yes, of course you know Jamie. And um, has he had a has he had a podcast by the way? Because if he hasn't, he should have. He is not. Like, let's we need to hook that up. I need to get him on here. Absolutely, um, he would be great for this. So we we're at Worlds of Flavor, and um, you know I'm surrounded. I'm in this. You know, it's it's CIA. So you've got the chefs who work there, and they're all, you know they've got their totes and their white jackets and all of this and i'm like oh god like i haven't been in this i haven't been immersed in this world for a while so i'm like okay so i'm like on my best behavior you know in the kitchen and you know um making sure also that just you know everything is just everything is just up to spec and uh, like overdoing it and uh, jamie was cooking and i was cooking next to some amazing chefs like jamie's prepping down like um a couple tables from me and uh, I don't recall what he was doing. I think it had to do something with cauliflower and white chocolate and caviar. And that's that flavor combination is a little bit like it's been done. But the way that he explained it to me, he was like, I know it's been done. And I'm doing it this way because and like he had this like really like in-depth. He really thought about this and it was absolutely delicious and um, I'm like, I, I don't do that. <laughs> I don't do that. And I'm looking at my dish and I did um, butter noodles. I did butter noodles. No, it was a fancy butter noodles, but I did this um, hyper technique uh, butter, ne- butter noodles with um, black truffle. And um, I mean, it was a good dish. I liked it. And I was like, the, for what I was trying to do there, it also illustrated the control freak and the ability to hold this Bermonte very stable and so forth. And so I bang up these butter noodles. He does his session. Like I do my session. And then like, we don't see each other for the rest of the conference. And I'm thinking about his dish, like his dish, like stopped me dead in my tracks. It was so I'm thinking about it for like days after the conference. And I'm just like, I can't get it out of my mind. And I'm like, and I made butter noodles. What was I thinking? And then like, so I see him, I think it was actually then again at Star Chefs, like a little while, a short while later, like whatever that was happens right before Star Chefs. I see him and I'm like, man. And I told him this and he's like, dude, your dish was so homey. And then immediately like the blood drains out of my face. I'm like, oh my God, this chef who trains with like the Boku's team tells me my food is homey, right? Like, and now I'm just like, I feel even worse, right? And I'm like, so I, and I, that comes out of my mouth. I tell him, I'm like, my food is homey. Like that's, that's not good. I guess I got to, you know, brush up on my skills. He's like, no man, the opposite. Like, that's what I want to eat. Like, I don't want to eat what I made. I want to eat what you made. Like that was really delicious and all that. And that made me feel so much better. And then I started to think like, yeah, I don't, you know, train with the Boku's team and I don't, you know, feed hundreds of people every night, but damn it. I make really delicious food. I can conduct myself in the kitchen when I need to. I can, I have that whole chef's skill set in my back pocket and I apply it to everything I do. But yeah, I don't work in a restaurant, um, but I still have that backbone and I exercise my skill set in another area of the food industry and that's okay. Sorry, that's my rant. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm with you. I, I always kind of say I've started Chefs Without Restaurants because I had a chip on my shoulder. You know, it's really hard. Um, one of the things that I was so scared to say for so many years is I've literally never worked in a restaurant. Like everyone's like, what? Like, I thought you did. No, I started in food in 92, but that was at Burger King. And then I went to culinary school and I did an internship in a hotel. 
that had a restaurant, but I've exclusively worked in, worked in like contract food. I've worked for Sodexo and Compass Group. I've been a catering manager at a hospital. I've worked for Ikea. Um, you know, I've done all these things and it's never been a restaurant. I've never worked like when I worked at Sodexo, I was at a place that was high end that we had a line that ran like a restaurant, but I didn't work at a restaurant. We were doing a thousand covers a day across five venues and I had 125 employees, but it was not a restaurant. We did better food than most of the restaurants in town. And you could come in from the public, but it wasn't like an actual legit restaurant. And you would meet people and they'd say, oh, what do you do? I'm a chef. And they get really excited and say, awesome, where do you work? And I'd be like, I work for Sodexo at a retirement community. And you'd see this like, oh, and then you would like backpedal yeah. and like, no, 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 like I do really cool stuff. Like we break down whole fish, we do sous vide, I'm doing infusions and, and like you, you lost them because like you're not a real chef. And part of me, like I felt when I built my own business, I almost couldn't tell people what I did. So like when I started Perfect Little Bites, nobody knew who I was. Like my avatar for like four years was like me holding a, a raw pig's head in front of my face. I remember that. And there was no discussion about like where I worked. I was just like, I was, you know, a chef. I had perfect little bites as a personal chef business. I have a blog, but I felt like that if people knew who I was, I'd be outed as like this guy who like, you know, fake it till you make it like, Oh, I'm working in a retirement community for Sodexo. Like I'm not a real chef and there's no way I'm paying this guy a hundred dollars a head. And it wasn't until I really found validation through the blogging and meeting people in the chef world. There's some people who've been super supportive of me. You know, when I started my path, guys, um, mostly through Twitter, you know, I, I love Twitter. I've talked about it a lot, but guys like, especially in the Boston scene, like Matt Jennings, uh, Brandon Baltzley, who was in Chicago at the time, um, Jamie Bissonnette, like these guys, like really, they would repost my stuff. They would share what I did. And I felt like, wow, there are these like really awesome restaurant chefs who are well-regarded, who think highly enough of me to share my stuff. And then, you know, when you get follows by like Sean Brock and Hugh Atchison and Renee Redzepi, I was like, you know, like, oh, like maybe it's time to like put the pig's head away and like show my real self. And I was also afraid that, you know, I was side hustling and I thought my bosses were going to fire me because I had a job on the side and they were going to let me go because I was trying to build a business that, that I could leave and do. So that was part of it too. But a lot of it was the insecurity that like I wasn't a real chef because I'd never worked in a restaurant and never worked with these cool people. I'd never staged anywhere, you know, and I think that's a real thing, especially for people like us who are not restaurant chefs. Yeah, I. It is great to hear somebody else hear hear somebody else you know just talk about that experience, and I think it's it's so many people. I there are more people who don't work in restaurants than people who do who, and work in food than the people who actually work in restaurants. Like the industry is so much bigger than just restaurants. A hundred percent. You know, for me, it was always like work life balance. Of I came out of culinary school with a debt I had to pay back. $404 a month for 10 years. Oh, mine was even beyond that. Mine was beyond that. So to come out, you're basically paying like a car payment or like half your month's rent. Like you couldn't go and make $10 an hour. I had to go work in contract food where I got better money. Oh, and by the way, like I had every other weekend off and I had a 401k and I had like two to four weeks vacation, like all good things. And I could yeah. still do really awesome food. But, you know, everyone wants to hear that you got out of culinary school and you're working at some Michelin star restaurant. Yeah. And that was the picture that like I painted for myself. I thought that was the path that was, you know, I was going to work. I was it, three stars was the goal, man. And um, then I started working and I realized I'm like, no, I weekends are awesome. Like I, I, I like what I liked what I did. But like when it's 85 and sunny in Chicago and I and there's droves of people headed down North Avenue walking to the beach and I'm walking into the you know back door of an alley in an alley like it kind of sucked a little bit I'm not gonna lie and it's also kind of a young man's game I mean there's one thing when you're oh, yeah. in, your, in your 20s and you're single or whatever but now I'm married and I have two kids you know I want to spend time with them I want to have some balance there and I'm able to do that now and I think a lot of people want to do that and I don't think we should be shamed for wanting to have time with our family. I mean, I know you're newly married. I'm sure your wife already has enough challenges uh, when you're traveling so much, not to put words in anyone's mouth, but I know like my wife would hate it if she never saw me. And if yeah. I spent half my time traveling, that would be tough alone. It wouldn't have worked. I mean, it wouldn't have worked if I would have stayed in a restaurant. That was the kind of the whole thing. It was like, so like when I did, so I, what the, the genesis of me getting out was, 
I didn't know I, at that time I had my palate and I liked food to taste the way that I wanted it to taste. I knew the cuisine that I wanted to cook. I wanted to do things the way I wanted to do it. And I was ready to do that. Did I know anybody who was going to cut me a big fat check to open a restaurant? Nope. Did I want to work in, I could find a chef job somewhere else where I'd be working for someone else and then owe them my life and not be able to do my own food. Nope. Not going to happen. And I wanted to, I, that's when I kind of, I had met my wife and I was like, all right, well, I want to spend time with her. Okay. I guess I got to try something else. So like I started working at Sur La Tab, just teaching cooking classes. And I worked um, as a sales, I, I wasn't even making, I wasn't making enough money to sustain myself. So I would work as, um, as a chef and like do the classes. And then when I wasn't, I would work more hours as a sales associate just to, just to pick up the time. And then, um, one day out of the blue, there's just a dumb luck. It was a Facebook post, like poly science is looking for people to join the team. And I sent a, I sent a, um, you know, a reply to over like Facebook messenger. And, um, I never heard anything for like, um, or no, 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 they had the, no, that's right. They had the, um, the HR address listed there. So I sent my resume and I never had a resume, but I wanted, I was like, I like poli science. So I wrote a resume that night, sent it in. I heard nothing for months, like months. Forgot I even forgot about the whole thing. And one day out of the blue, the HR manager called me. was like, hey, are you still interested? And I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> and I figured I'd have to get on a plane and go. I didn't even know where poli science was. Turns out they were 30 minutes from my house. <laughs> wow, that seems like it was meant to be. Yeah, and here I am, eight years later, or whatever it is. I, I've lost track of time, but I like it. I mean, I enjoy it. We make cool stuff, and I like what we do. I just think there's so many avenues in the food world. If you love food and cooking, that you don't anymore have to be dedicated to being this like eighty hour a week line cook in a restaurant. And I just think there's some really cool stuff. And you know, I love sharing the stories of people who are doing cool things in the food world. Yeah, I mean, like look at uh, look at what jamie's doing at, at chef's garden so i mean he's he's both you know like i said they're they operate they train like the boku store team trains there there they have chef's garden or he's a uh, culinary vegetable institute so they're researching basically everything and anything that you can do with everything from growing the vegetables to eating the vegetables and then composting the, like everything and anything like unearthing all of that because that research just hasn't been done in the way and extent that they're doing it and he's also like a really badass chef. So there's him, my buddy Scott Guerin at um, Modernist Pantry, and um, he did like the formal like chef jacket toque thing for a long time. And then uh, he had some other interests, started a family, and was like, "Look, I gotta, I gotta do something else." So he hooked up with Modernist Pantry, and now he does a bunch of content for them. Test, re- he does recipe development for them. He also he helps people. Uh, helps customers. So if you've got a bag of, I don't know, NH pectin and you're like, my apple gel won't set, he can tell you exactly why it doesn't set or, you know, why it said too hard. And like, that's his job. But he did the, he did the restaurant thing for a while and it's, it's not for everybody. So is there anything you want to leave our listeners with before we jump off here today? What do I want to leave everybody with? I don't know. I think we talked a bit about, I, I, one, I just wanted to call attention to the, to the whole like chest out restaurants thing. And like, Thank you for doing that. Um, Because again, like the, the, as you said, uh, imposter syndrome. Yeah, I dealt with that for quite a while. So uh, one, when I heard you were doing this, I thought that was super cool. What else? I'm like, if we're going to do a shameless plug, um, PolyScience has um, some new circulators coming out. I can't share too many details about the, about the devices, but um, we have some new circulators coming out uh, probably probably like three months from now, they should be out. Um, so I've been working a lot, a lot of, on those and um, everybody should check out our Instagram, follow all our channels, all that good stuff, sign up for our newsletter. Um, for those who don't know, our social channels are at PolyScience, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, on Facebook, I think it's uh, PolyScience Culinary. Uh, check out our YouTube channel. And I have really comprehensive show notes. All of that'll be in there. I always link all the Instagram Twitter, YouTubes, if you have that. So that'll all be in there. And then I can also go back and retro anything. So in four months, when your new circulators can come out, I can get that stuff and put it in the show notes there. Right on. 
Um, yeah, I think that's really it. Everybody should keep their heads their heads up uh, and on the lookout for the for the new circulators. We just I just finished filming um, with an awesome production company here in Chicago last week Friday uh, on the on the new devices. So the content is in the can and the devices are on the way. So super excited for that. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that. I'll check that out. So to all of our listeners, this has been the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. As always, you can find us at chefswithoutrestaurants.com.org and on all social media channels. Thanks so much and have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. And if you're interested in being a guest on the show or sponsoring a show, please let us know. We can be reached at chefswithoutrestaurants at gmail.com. Thanks so much.